Okay, it's seven o'clock. We'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Welcome everybody. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> the uh, First item on the agenda of business is item two, election of a chairman and vice chair. I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Bill. I'm gonna preface that by saying I have no vested interest in being the chair. If anybody else would like to be the chair, anybody would like to nominate anybody else as chair, you will not hurt my feelings at all. And I'll turn it over to Bill. Thank you. Uh, pursuant to code, each January, uh, the board has to elect a chairman and vice chairman at its first meeting. That is the purpose of uh, the agenda matter before us this time. Uh, I would open up the floor to nominations for chair. I nominate Alan for chair. <laughs> <Second>. no <laughs> nomination from Dr. Day is second from, uh, I think that was Mr. Landers. Uh, any other nominations? I close the floor to nominations. All those in favor of Mr. Plakowicz as chair, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed like sign. Congratulations, Mr. Plakowicz, your chairman once again. I'd open the floor to nominations for vice chair. Do we have any nominations? Nominate Todd for vice chair. Mr. Brignano has been nominated by Dr. Day. Is there a second? I'll second. A second from uh, <laughs> Dan, Mr. Jordan Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stewart. Uh, any other nominations? I'd close the floor to nominations. All those in favor of Mr. Brugnano as vice chair, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed like sign. Motion carries unanimously. Mr. Chairman, the gavel is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, item three on the agenda is additions and deletions to the agenda. Uh, Mr. Bowling, are there any additions or deletions by staff? Any member of the commission have any additions or deletions? If not, we'll move forward with the agenda as written. Item four is approval of the minutes of December 8, 2016. You all have them in your package. Do we have any motions concerning those minutes? Motion to approve. Uh, Mr. Kelly has a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Dr. Day seconds that motion. All in favor, please signify by aye. 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 Any opposed, blank sign? Hearing none, that motion carries. That brings us to item five on the agenda, which is a consent item. It is quasi-judicial. I'll go ahead and read the uh, agenda item into the record. It is the Lost Tree Preserve PD request to modify the phasing schedule for the Lost Tree Preserve PD. Lost Tree Preserve LLC is the owner. Steve Melchiori is the agent. It's located north of 65th Street, just west of the FEC Railroad, and south of 69th Street. The zoning is PD, which is planned development. The land use designation is L1, which is low density one, up to three units per acre, and CI, commercial industrial. The density is 2.12. As I said, it is quasi-judicial, so before we address the merits, I'll ask if any member of the commission has had any ex parte communications with anybody concerning this matter, has conducted any site visits, separate investigations, or has any other reason why they cannot consider this matter on a fair basis based upon the law and the evidence. If not, we'll proceed forward. Uh, the, the record on this matter consists of our agenda items. Do we have any motion concerning this matter? Move to approve with staff's recommendations. Okay, Dr. Day moves to approve with staff's recommendations. Do we have a second? A second. Mr. Stewart, uh, do we have any discussion? All in favor, please signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries unanimously. That brings us to item 5B on the agenda, which again is a consent item, which is quasi-judicial. I'll read the entire uh, item into the record. It is Lake Sapphire West request for preliminary plat approval for an 18-lot subdivision to be known as Lake Sapphire West. GHO Lake Sapphire Corporation is the owner. Schulke, Biddle, and Stoddard is the agent. Locate, this is located immediately west of the Lake Sapphire subdivision on the north side of 5th Street Southwest, west of 43rd Avenue. The zoning is RS3, residential single family up to three units per acre. The land use designation is L1, which is low density one, residential up to three units per acre. 
The density is 1.89 units per acre. Again, it is quasi-judicial, so we'll start once again uh, asking if any member of the commission has had any ex parte communications, conducted any site visits or independent investigations, or has any other matter which they believe would, would uh, prevent them from considering this matter on a fair basis based upon the evidence in the law. Anything to disclose? If not, do we have any motion concerning this matter? Oh, I do want to disclose one thing. Um, and it was actually true about 5A and 5B. 5A involved some matters in December 2010. I was the county attorney at that time. Uh, I did not work on this matter at all. In fact, I have no recollection of it at all. And that is also true over here on um, 5B, the matter we're looking at right now, Lake Sapphire Corporation. Some matters occurred in 2013, and I was, I, I was county attorney until August 2013, so I don't know if I was county attorney when this matter came up, but again, I do not believe I worked on it. I have no recollection whatsoever of the matter. So having disclosed those items, um, do we have any motion with respect to, to item 5B on the agenda? Motion to approve with staff recommendations. <clears throat> Mr. Stewart makes the motion to approve uh, staff's recommendation with the are there conditions on this one? Um, yes, with the conditions. Do we have a second to the motion? Second. Uh, Mr. Kelly makes a second of that motion. Do we have any discussion concerning that motion? Landers. Oh, I'm sorry, I keep calling you Kelly. Why am I, oh, Chip Kelly, that's the coach of whatever football team. <laughs> Ooh, that hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he coach at uh, like Notre Dame at one point or was it Oregon? I don't know. Yeah, but, uh, he's coached a couple of places. See you guys, you, you're the fourth senior member and I can't remember your name because <laughs> you've been here one meeting before. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, you're right, okay. Mr. Landers. Okay, Mr. Landers made the second. Do we have any further discussion concerning the motion? All in favor of the motion, please signify by aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carrying none, that motion carries unanimously. That brings us to item 6A on the agenda, Riviera Lake, also a quasi-judicial matter. This is not on consent. We will hold a hearing. This is Riviera Lake, request for preliminary plat approval for a 44-lot subdivision to be known as Riviera Lake. Tri-Gem Management LLC is the owner. Knight McGuire and Associates is the agent. It's located on the east side of 27th Avenue, approximately 350 feet south of 4th Street. Zoning is RS6, residential, single family, up to six units per acre. The land use designation is L2, low density two, residential, up to six units per acre. The density is 2.44 units per acre. As I said, it's quasi-judicial, so again, we'll begin with asking any member of the commission to disclose any ex parte communications they've had concerning this matter, any independent investigations, site visits, or any other fact gathering activities they've undertaken, or any other conflict or matter which you believe might cause you to not be able to consider this matter on a fair basis based upon the law and evidence. Does any commissioner have any matter to disclose? If not, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Bowling and well, actually, any, yeah, anybody who plans to testify in this matter, please stand and be sworn by the clerk. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. <clears throat> and we will now start with the county's presentation. Yes. Thank you, Chairman Plackwich. John McCoy with the county planning staff. <clears throat> this is the Rivier Lake preliminary plat application. And as a preliminary plat, it does require uh, action by the Planning and Zoning Commission. The subject site is located between 27th and 24th Avenue, just south of 4th Street. The subject site's zoned RS6 residential, single family up to six units per acre, as are all the surrounding properties. To the east across 24th Avenue is more conventional single family subdivision. Um, to the north and south are larger lot RS6 uh, single family properties. Uh, to the west across 27th Avenue is Citrus Elementary School. And when we look at the, uh, the aerial, you can see the edge of Citrus on the west side of 27th Avenue. The site's outlined in a, a black line. Uh, 27th Avenue on the west, 4th Street to the north, 
24th Avenue uh, to the uh, to the east and uh, the subject site uh, is what it is it's shown and then you can see also the surrounding single-family development as well the uh, uh, the subject preliminary plat proposes 44 lots on around 18 acres and that yields an approximate density of 2.4 units per acre uh, as noted in the staff report this uh, the subject site had a previous preliminary plat for 66 lots and that preliminary plat has since expired if approved this would be the controlling uh, preliminary plat on the subject site as far as traffic circulation access will be from 27th avenue with the southbound left turn lane at the project entrance it'll be a uh, inbound and then essentially a looped system and an emergency secondary access to 24th avenue on the east side of the project uh, stormwater management uh, will be handled by a stormwater retention area in the center uh, stormwater will be routed there treated as far as uh, landscaping and environmental aspects there are buffers required adjacent to the roadways which are 25 foot wide type b landscape buffers there are not buffers required on the north and south where it's adjacent to other single family properties as far as upland <coughs> set aside there's an upland set aside which mostly fulfills the 15 percent set aside of the native uplands and those also fulfill to supplement the buffer so you have a greater buffer from 27th avenue southwest as far as environmental conditions there are uh, about seven and a half acres of low quality wetlands all those wetlands will be impacted the applicant will be required uh, to get a wetlands mitigation permit they will be required to mitigate the impact of those wetlands um, most likely with mitigation credits in a mitigation bank there are 4.66 acres of native uplands they're satisfying their set aside criteria mostly with uh, uh, conservation areas on the site and then a small fee in lieu of what uh, is not makes up that what does not total the 15 percent as far as tree preservation and mitigation that'll be handled as the plan is developed through the land development permit process and then for gopher tortoises only to gopher tortoise permit for the relocation of any gopher tortoises found on site as far as dedications and improvements the 27th avenue 24 <coughs> avenue buffer will be uh, an improvement there will be a 25 foot wide right-of-way dedication for a portion on 24th avenue 27th avenue sidewalk will be constructed uh, prior to a certificate of completion the internal sidewalks will be constructed as shown on the preliminary plat and on the lots as will be constructed with the single family homes for the common areas will be constructed prior to a certificate of completion street lights will be constructed and uh, they'll satisfy their green space and recreation open space uh, criteria staff recommends approval with the conditions listed in the recommendation and those are summarized on the slide thank you does any member of the commission have any questions comments concerning the county's presentation i have two quick things um, which i guess really contribute to the education of black which again but i noticed that um, the density you have a note on the density that says the density calculation is based on the project's gross area and the prior uh, agenda item said the density calculation is based on the project's total area I, I guess I've been assumed not that I create a distinction there but they're both kind of pointing in the same direction I'm assuming that when you talk about the project's overall density you're always talking about the total area you know in other words the units number of units divided in a we try to use gross density because when you start to take out right-of-way densities if you look at it especially later in time and it was at its maximum density and then you start to subtract some for rights of ways you could end up with a a project that would appear to have been in excess of the density at the time it was approved so okay. we, we always try to use an, a gross acreage figure okay uh, and the second item i had was um, the right of way for 27th avenue the county's thoroughfare plan requires an ultimate right of way of 130 feet presently there's only 80 feet so essentially you need 25 feet assuming you work off the center line which 
theoretically, if you do it on this project, I assume that eats up the buffer that's there. And, and I just really need to be educated as to the county's policy. You say here that the county decided um, the Public Works Department has chosen not to acquire the additional right of way. But how are you going to get to 130 feet as we, as we approve projects that rely upon at least that 25 feet on the side of the existing 80 foot right of way? Right, that's a, that's a very good question. Along, uh, along stretches of 20, and excuse me for the voice, it's not all entirely there. Um, for some stretches, probably more remote or, or rural stretches of 27th Avenue, uh, you would get this 130 foot ultimate right of way with swale drainage and so forth. And some areas we would expect it to be much less than 130 feet that's required because they do an, uh, an urban design and not handle the drainage in, sw in swales along the entire segment. Uh, they would divert it into stormwater ponds that were periodically spaced throughout the project. So in this location, in this proximity to, uh, to the intersection, uh, Public Works determined that, that they did not need it at this time. What would likely happen here is if there were to be a widening project for 27th Avenue, there would be negotiations with the elementary school, probably, uh, and also uh, a design that was much narrower than the 130 feet ultimate. Um, the way that the planting will happen, though, on this 25-foot front buffer is that the actual planted material won't be on the western edge of that buffer. So in the future, if 10 more feet were needed, for instance, from this project, uh, it would be taking a green landscape area, but it wouldn't be taking landscaping improvements uh, or irrigation, that sort of thing. So we can probably get a little bit more later in, in the future if we need to, and this is going to be an urban section area and it won't need 130 feet. As, we, as the county acquires property to, to expand 27th Avenue, whatever it needs at that particular location. I assume we're in a purchase situation there? Yes. Okay, as opposed to the other side of this project on 24th Street where the applicant was required to dedicate Cor or give us. Correct, it's, it's a generalized standard. There's <clears throat> sort of three different versions. There's the local road where if it's 60 feet or if it's less than 60 feet, which is our local road standard, the uh, site needs to dedicate the fair share to get it up to the 60 feet and that's what's happening on 24th Avenue it's less than 60 feet and they're dedicating to bring it up to the local road standard once it gets above that 60 feet um, we need to essentially compensate the uh, landowner for that property since it's above and beyond the local road standard they're then contributing to a, a thoroughfare or a, a transportation system that's more than just for their own site and that's where you know, the resources are limited and Public Works has to make that decision. Do they want to start acquisition at this time and uh, enter that process or do they want to look at uh, more pressing uh, priorities and allocate the resources towards those? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments to staff? Hey, I, I've got a question about the sidewalk on 27th Avenue. Um, and that's a relatively short run and it, it ends up being what I call a fragmented sidewalk. Uh, and, you know, looking at the development, it's not clear to me whether they'll, that sidewalk will ever be much longer. And right now, they're along 27th Avenue, the west side. There's a sidewalk that goes all the way from Route 60 to 1st Street Southwest, I think, uh, uninterrupted. Um, would it make sense uh, at the two extremes of that to put a crossing uh, where people, because what happens when you're on a fragmented sidewalk you walk there until you run out of sidewalk and then you cross the road. And 27th is usually a fairly easy road to cross, but sometimes not so much. Right. No, it's a good, good question. In this particular case, uh, what you have is, a, is what would ultimately be a, a fairly short segment to get to the intersection at 4th Street going to the north. Uh, so I think that this, this segment that the developer will put in uh, will benefit residents, especially if uh, a, there's at some point in time a, a short segment done by the county uh, or the school board, you know, may, maybe a joint type of effort to extend the sidewalk up to the intersection. And that's where you want crosswalks. And that's yeah. probably the only place you would want crosswalks anywhere along 27th Avenue. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Yes. And that was Mr. Landers. My, um, that was one of my questions regarding the fragmented sidewalk, is there any plans for the county uh, or the uh, school district that we're aware of to 
extend that sidewalk on the uh, east side of the road. I mean, with all the kids from the school there, um, not all of them are coming from the west side of 27th Avenue. So, are there any plans that we're aware of? Not currently for this particular segment, but uh, periodically, actually, the MPO works with the school board to identify safe routes to school type of areas and areas as they, they get more uh, population, uh, we identify sidewalk segments to, to connect up fragments and, and make a continuous walk. I'm not aware of one in this particular area, but I think this would become a candidate because it, there would be a short seg it would be a short project to do uh, to benefit uh, not only uh, the, the people in this particular subdivision, but if you've got uh, any other kind of um, access through this subdivision, you know, pedestrian access through this subdivision, they can get to the sidewalk there on the east side. So I think this could make it on the radar screen eventually. Yeah, I would be very concerned with the little kids walking through that area. Um, so that's just my two cents for that. I, I do have a question regarding the exit to 24th Avenue. And I'm assuming that is strictly an exit out of the neighborhood. It, it could be an entrance or exit. It is uh, designed to be an emergency access um, from the standpoint of emergency vehicles could enter or exit through it if uh, access from 27th Avenue were eliminated. Um, I, from an operational standpoint, it will probably be up to the subdivision property owners association how they would manage that from the standpoint of access, entry and exits for their residents. And from that standpoint, you know, what I've seen is most property owners associations tend to keep them secured. So we really don't know whether it's going to be, I'm just thinking of the traffic that's going to be generated out of the subdivision for uh, the residents that would access 4th Street and head east, they would probably go out of the back of the neighborhood instead of just going on 27th Avenue and going to the intersection. So there is some increasing traffic that we'd be looking at. Correct. There may be some residents that would choose to use that if that's an alternative. Yeah, and I'm going from memory, so forgive me, but isn't that a dirt road at this point? It, in time? Correct. It is. It is. It is. So. And it actually has, um, <clears throat> does not have sufficient right of way to be improved to, to county standards at this point in time, not, not for the whole length of it. We anticipate, as John said, that this would probably be, uh, it has to be available and, and designed for emergency access. Emergency services would have to have the codes to any gate, that sort of thing like we have in a lot of subdivisions. Um, we anticipate that that's how it's going to be used for emergency access and probably pedestrian access, but it'll be controlled. And that then leads to the 27th Avenue exit of the community. Is that strictly a, a, nor, a northbound exit? There's no, they're, the, not, they're not going to be allowed to go south out of that. Uh, they won't be restricted from going south. There's, it's not a median to stretch a property. They could go south. Okay, I would have concerns about that because of the traffic through there, um, especially school time um, and 4.35 o'clock. So they would be allowed to leave there and head south and cross traffic. And Correct. It, it's designed as a full movement driveway. As you're saying, sometimes it might be one of those times where it's more efficient to go north, to go south, or go right. To Similar to Ainsley, yeah. which is supposed to be strictly a exit and head east. and not always followed but okay any other questions or comments is the applicant here would the applicant like to make any comments uh, good evening my name is Scott McGuire with Knight McGuire Associates uh, representing the applicant um, uh, 80 Royal Palm Point in Vero Beach a uh, couple of things the access the emergency access to the east to 24th Avenue will strictly be for emergency vehicles and there's a pedestrian access through there. So we'll have a gate, the fire department will have a combination and everything. We will not use that for any vehicular access. Okay. Uh, and then as far as the turning movements out on 27th Avenue, um, you know, we've gone through the whole traffic study and there's no preclusion for any turning movements there we're 
relatively close to Fourth Street, which effectively, <coughs> the light turns red, you have an opportunity to go out. So, you know, it, it, the the effects of that light will allow people to get out, even if they have to wait until the light changes uh, for their left turn movements. Any questions or comments of Mr. Knight? <coughs> If not, do you have any questions or comments of staff, or does staff have any questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other member of the public, or anybody else care to present any evidence? Any member of the public wish to be heard on this? If not, we'll go ahead and close the quasi-judicial hearing. Commissioners, what is your pleasure? Let me put it differently. Do we have a motion then with respect to? We'll move to approve with staff's recommendation. Okay, Dr. Day has made the motion to approve staff's recommendation. Do we have a second? I'll second. Mr. Stewart has uh, seconded that. Do we have any discussion on the motion? If not, all in favor, please signify by aye. 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 Any opposed, like sign? Hearing none, that motion carries unanimously. Uh, as a general matter, again, helping me understand some of these things, <coughs> Under what circum what what are the criteria for subdivisions require uh, with respect to whether a secondary emergency access is required or not required? With respect to the land development regulations, it's once it's 100 units or greater, there's the requirement for a secondary. Um, in most cases, um, such as this situation where the layout lent itself to that availability, but it had fewer units. We try to, you know, have that provided as a secondary or an alternative uh, for emergency services. So there is a second way in, second way out. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is item 6B, which again, quasi-judicial, non-consent, so there will be a hearing. Uh, this is the Lakes at Waterway Village PODs, or PODs, S, T, and U, request for preliminary PD plan approval for 156 residential units to be known as the Lakes at Waterway Village. Uh, pods S, T, and U. DeVosta Homes LP is the owner. Kimley Horn Associates, Inc. is the agent. It's located just south of 53rd Street and just west of the future 43rd Avenue extension. The zoning is PD, plan development, up to 2.29 units per acre. The land use designation is L2, low density 2, which is residential up to 6 units per acre. The density is 2.38 units per acre. It is quasi-judicial. Again, I'll start by asking the commissioners to disclose any ex-party communications, site visits, independent investigations, uh, anything that you might be aware of that might uh, prevent you from considering this matter on a fair basis based upon the law and the evidence. Does any commissioner have any item? I will disclose that um, while I was county attorney, I did work on one or two matters concerning Waterway Village. Uh, they were quite congenial. As I recall, the primary thing we worked on was an agreement matter that uh, was submitted to the court and by stipulation, the, a, either a court judgment order, I don't remember the specifics, was entered. But I certainly retained neither hostility nor favor toward Waterway Village. So with that, anybody have any question about my disclosure? If not, let's proceed with the hearing. We'll go ahead and open the hearing, and I'd ask the clerk to swear. Anybody who plans to testify in this matter, please stand and be sworn in. Do you swear firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And we'll start with the county's presentation. Thank you, Chairman Plackwich. John McCoy with the County Planning Department. This is an application by Waterway Village, DeVosta Homes, for the Lakes at Waterway Village pods STNU. And <clears throat> this is a continuation of the Lakes at Waterway Village neighborhood. And you won't actually, in the future, see pods STNU. That's more for planning and development purposes than it will be for marketing and home sales. So these will be neighborhoods within the Lakes at Waterway Village. Uh, and <clears throat> the last pod we looked at was pod R, which was the last one that came before you all, which is also part of the lakes at Waterway Village. Uh, the subject site 
is located <clears throat> along the northern boundary of the overall waterway village project. 53rd Street is the northern boundary. Uh, the future 43rd Avenue would be the eastern boundary, and it uh, comes down to some of the uh, ongoing and uh, development, and then comes back along the eastern boundary to some undeveloped <clears throat> property within Waterway Village. Uh, Ariel is, uh, is fairly recent, but if uh, any of y'all have been out to the site recently, uh, this portion of Waterway Village in the center that's dirt now uh, actually has homes on it. So uh, it's not completely built, but there's home construction going on, as well as a road that comes in and comes down to the south and terminates about this point on the south. And then also what you see labeled as Pendleton is also paved with homes being constructed on that northern stretch of Pendleton. Pod R is just to the south here, and it'll be cleared and dirt if you've been out there recently. And then the subject site is very similar to the way Pod R was in this photograph. And this is the subject site for pods S, T, and U. And you can kind of make out the alignment of 43rd Avenue, the future 43rd Avenue, on the aerial as well. The proposed development consists of 65 acres, 156 residential units, the perimeter buffers, which will be along 43rd and 53rd, stormwater, common area tracks, and the internal roadway improvements. This uh, shows you the layout, and I'll walk you through the pods. Pod T, single family development internal loop road. Pod S, also single family development internal loop road. Pod U is a duplex proposed development and uh, Waterway Village Boulevard is the main road through, and it connects to the proposed future 43rd Avenue at the, uh, at the its eastern end. This is a, how the project sits in an overall sort of conceptual layout of their roadways, and all these roads are not in. Uh, this road is built again down to about here, Pendleton, the interior loop roads, Pod R, and then the proposed pods S, T, and U uh, coming out to the future 43rd Avenue, 43rd Avenue up to 53rd Street. As far as traffic circulation within <clears throat> this pod, what we'll have is <clears throat> we'll have <clears throat> starting <clears throat> at the west a connection from 51st Court. 51st Court is in and runs from 53rd Street down to 49th Street. So you when you come in, you can drive in here, and there'll be home signs for model homes. You can come in, you can drive uh, down to the south, and you can drive to Pendleton. This will allow, uh, when this road is built, Waterway Village will project up through these pods and then connect to 43rd Avenue. So you'll be able to connect from 51st Court to 43rd Avenue. Uh, the residents will be internal because these are gated while 43rd and 51st Court are open streets. <clears throat> Internal, essentially it'll be uh, s single family loop roads within each pod providing access to the actual lots. As far as dedications and improvements of sidewalks are proposed on both sides of the internal streets <clears throat> along the project's Waterway Village frontage and along the site's 43rd Avenue to be constructed 43rd Avenue segment. Uh, as part of this project, they're going to hit the number of units that are going to require them to build that segment of 43rd Avenue from Waterway Village Boulevard to 53rd Street. So during this construction, that will be part of the improvements that will occur. As far as environmental aspects, most of the big picture environmental aspects got addressed uh, with the DRI approval and with the initial phases of construction. A lot of the upland set aside, things like that. So those uh, have been satisfied. What haven't been satisfied are the pod by pod basis. And those do get satisfied on a pod by pod. Uh, the gopher tortoises permits active, it gets, they get relocated and uh, tree mitigation occurs. Those sorts of activities that are a, uh, what you'd call maybe an ongoing permitting activity, standard permitting activity. And those occur with each pod. 
and those are the things that will need to be done with this spot from an environmental aspect. Uh, from a buffer plan, again, it's the perimeter buffers. It's the buffer along 53rd Street and the buffer along 43rd Avenue. And those will be very consistent with the buffers that you see out there today, if you're familiar with the buffers at Waterway Village. Um, kind of a, a large, uh, gently sloping berm with a landscape and a, uh, in some cases, a uh, black vinyl clad chain link fence interior to the landscape that is, uh, is fairly well hidden. With that, staff does recommend that the Planning and Zoning Commission grant preliminary PD approval for Waterway Village Pods STNU with the conditions that we have outlined regarding the landscape buffers, the offside sidewalks, and the north segment of 43rd Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have any questions? Any member of the commission have any questions or comments directed to staff? If not, is the applicant here? Would the applicant like to make any comments? My name is Ken Augusetti, Gimli Orton Associates here on behalf of the applicant. I don't have anything to comment on, but if you have questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. Does any member of the commission have any questions? Thank you very much. Anybody else wish to be heard in this matter? Any member of the public? If not, we'll go ahead and close the quasi-judicial hearing. And again, members of the commission, um, do we have any motions with respect to this matter? Move to approve with staff's recommendations. Dr. Day made the motion. Ms. Waldrop has seconded that motion. Do we have any discussion concerning that motion? If not, all in favor, please signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries unanimously. That brings us to item 7A which is a continued public hearing. <clears throat> the agenda item is a continued public hearing on the consideration of proposed amendments to the county sign regulations, land development regulations, chapter 901, definitions, and chapter 956, sign regulations, and chapter 912, single family development. This is a legislative matter. So we'd begin with any presentation by county staff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, I'm Roland DeBlois, Chief of County Environmental Planning and Code Enforcement. Uh, as indicated, this is a continuation of the December 8th hearing that, that started on this relating to proposed amendments to the sign ordinance. Just a recap from what was presented at the December hearing meeting. Uh, the County Commission has directed staff to look at revising the county sign regulations in light of a U.S. Supreme Court decision, specifically a case Reed versus Town of Gilbert, Arizona. The significance of the case is that the court finding was that the town regulated signs differently based on sign content, which is, was deemed a violation of freedom of speech under the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, under that case, the court clarified localities can regulate sign size, location, physical characteristics, and duration of display, but on a content neutral basis. The decision has had broad reaching implications for nationwide for local government regulation of signs to address this issue of content neutrality versus content based regulation. And that's the motivation behind uh, these proposed amendments. Uh, the proposed amendments that we are that were before you in December, and we're, we've revised based on comments, they're narrowly focused to resolve the content-based sign regulation issues. Um, so the proposed amendment revision categories, which, after review by staff, there are certain areas that we focus on for this purpose. Uh, definitions in our definition chapter again. There's over 40 different definitions for different types of signs. We focused on eliminating certain definitions that were content-based versus otherwise. A permanent exempt signs, such as garage sale signs and real estate open house signs, we looked at that section just to make sure we're, we would be regulating the signs uh, in a content-neutral way. And then we also focused on temporary signs requiring permits such as countywide special event signs and countywide campaign signs, which we do distinguish from signs on individual lots. 
at the last uh, meeting or the beginning of this hearing, uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission did review it, provided staff with comments and specific recommendations on certain categories. And those are the ones that we have done some revisions since December to address those comments. Uh, first comment to reference regarding category in our ordinance on temporary signs and construction sites. Uh, there was a concern expressed that as was presented, there's certain separation distance from rights of way. Uh, the comment was to also include a, a distance from easement so as not to obstruct easement. So we revised it to account for that. Allow signs close to the property lines, 10, 10 foot setback instead of a 20 foot setback, which we've modified. Regarding on premise yard or window signs under the permit exempt signs, these include political signs on individual lots as an example of this type of sign. There was a discussion, you might recall, under the proposed amendment that we presented at the December meeting, we had a recommendation of a limit of maximum number of signs per lot to four signs, just in the, on the basis of trying to limit, uh, discourage proliferation and clutter. But the discussion was, um, towards what, what the current ordinance is, which essentially doesn't put a limit and allows a sign per candidate per issue. And we didn't, so we went and revised it to uh, account for that. So now it does allow for the one sign per candidate issue or topic on election ballot. We also looked at, and this was discussed last meeting on, when you have a long frontage lot on a road, there, would seem to be more opportunity for signs versus a standard size lots. Uh, so we looked at revising the code, which does allow more signs if you have um, more frontage. We also looked at the regulations for active subdivision or real estate development sites. And again, we had some comments from the commission. You might recall when we presented it to the board um, in December, we're recommending that there be a, um, a limitation on signs posted at the entranceways to subdivision to authorize agents representing 10 or more lots. There was a discussion on, well, what about the ones who have less than 10? And again, we, uh, to address that, we did revise it to allow for signs for an agent representing less than 10 lots. We also looked at temporary signs of limited geographic scope and number. These are the permit exempt sign category. And then one of the things we talked about again, um, this covers signs such as garage sale signs and open house signs. We're trying to strike a, a, a medium where the duration of number of days per calendar year that would apply would be equitable for all different types of signs under this category since they're content neutral regulations. And we had proposed 18 days in the, in the uh, previous draft <coughs> to account for some discussion that particular to open houses, we try to accommodate them for more opportunity for open house uh, signs off site, leading, directing people to houses to give them a little more time than the 18. So. You know, our position is there still needs to be a cap to present just an un, un, unlimited uh, allowance. So our proposal is to up the 18 day, which we had in the previous draft to 24 days, which we think is reasonable in, in balancing the uh, effort to put a cap on, on proliferation. Uh, in summary, um, when I'm trying to address this issue again, which is to move our ordinance towards content neutral regulation versus content based. The revisions are tied to regulations based on size, location, number, and duration of display instead of the sign content. So that was really the focus of our revisions. Um, our ordinance, as we had said at the last meeting, our ordinance that we have now was substantially created in the mid 80s. There's a lot of public hearings and workshops that went into it. So we're not looking at a, to revamp the whole ordinance. We're really, the focus of this is to address the, uh, the issue of the content-based, content-neutral signs. 
So there are certain things that are still in the ordinance that are still intact. For example, there are certain signs that we do prohibit. Other signs we regulate, more permanent signs, which get into uh, more structural design issues. So those will still be uh, unchanged under these revisions. The amendments allow for temporary signs to be displayed, in some cases for longer periods than we currently allow, but still with limits to meet our county objectives. And just to keep, you know, keep focus on what the, the objectives of our ordinances and most local ordinances to avoid sign clutter, but also to provide for public and pedestrian safety, promote aesthetics, but to also accommodate free speech and in, in local business. So look, all, all things considered, staff feel that we've appropriately addressed the, uh, the issue and it's, it's uh, amendments that we would recommend that the commission recommend that the Board of County Commissioners adopt. Okay, do we have any questions or comments from the commissioners? And the, the enforcement of this falls to your department, right? Yes. Uh, and is that driven mainly off of complaints? Uh, mainly. But again, if we, we also look for equitable enforcement. So if we're get a complaint about a sign and we see 10 signs on the way or in the area, we're going to be looking at those too. The other thing I would just add is <clears throat> this is one of the kinds of violations that's difficult to hide because signs are meant to be prominent. So a lot of times it's they're out there and they're noticeable by any, any of the code officers driving around in their district. Any other questions or comments? I do have a couple of questions. Um, the proposed ordinance, attachment two, page five, section 2H. And that deals with temporary signs that require a permit or temporary signs that don't require a permit. And the, the difference seems to be in the language, temporary signs of limited geographic scope and number don't require a permit. But temporary signs of broader geographic scope and number do. And I'm kind of looking at that language, trying to reach some type of clear understanding as to where that line is. Wondered if there's any better language, more descriptive, that could tell us. Um, because, you know, what's limited and what's broader, you know, where is that line? It, it could be almost anywhere. Well, I mean, let me just say, within the context of the full paragraph sections, the limited scope essentially is geared towards sign on premises. Let's use a garage sale sign as an as example, though we're not, we're trying to be content neutral here. But nevertheless, where you have a sign essentially at the on premises, but then you have uh, two signs or so that will direct someone from the main street to your residence. That's, and that's under the exemption. Similar signs that would apply to say open house. The other broader category, the intent anyway, is to make the distinction that you do need a permit if you're going to be putting up signs countywide, like for a special event or for a campaign, countywide that doesn't entail signs on just individual parcels, but spread out throughout the county off premises. That's the that's distinguish we're trying to make between per those types of signs where you don't, do need a permit or you don't, you're exempt because it's small scale. Is there any language that tends to give that explanation that you just gave? Right, the, the issue is limited geographic scope and broader geographic scope. Yeah, and number. I mean, yeah, you know, what we, we could actually put a number in the title if of that section of, of limited scope and I, I, well, geographic. Again, we we did put in. We actually had to draft this initially without the word geographic. To define what uh, scope was, we put in geographic. And that was to, to, again, distinguish small vicinity around the subject property versus countywide. You're, you're correct. You do have to read further into the criteria to see how that, that plays out. One of the difficulties with defining the geographic scope we wouldn't necessarily want to say countywide because someone might just be interested in signs along a corridor. 
And it's like, well, I'm not doing it countywide. You know, I mean, the, so there's, I think it's difficult to define the geography other than it's an area that's off-site and you're probably going to have a series of the signs. And, and I'll just make this point. I, I don't consider that an item that would prevent me from voting in favor to move forward. But at the same time, with a background as a lawyer and having spent a fair amount of time in court trying to explain to judges what something means sometimes, I know that that could be a problem for the county sometime. And you might, you know, after this hearing, before you bring it to the county commission, think through that a little bit because I can see a judge sitting there saying, you know, well, what's a limited geographic scope and what is, what makes it broader? When, sure. do, at what point does it become broader? Sure. And that's a tough question for a lawyer to answer with any type of specificity. And I, we appreciate that comment. And we'll we'll run it back through the attorney's office and and see. And, and I see. and I fully appreciate the, you know, the difficult situation you're in trying to describe a a uh, a line between you know those requiring a permit and those not requiring a permit, and trying to do so with reference to location and duration and things like that as opposed to content. Uh, but I don't know, maybe perhaps you could give some examples, you know, uh, you know, examples include but not limited to, mm -hmm. and then give examples where the event that's being advertised, for example, is, is on a single parcel with, uh, you know, like a property that's for sale or uh, an open house or something like that. I don't know. But help the lawyer out who's going to try to defend this someday. <laughs> we, we, we will take your advice. Um, Another question I had, just a minor thing. The very next paragraph right under that is, is entitled Number of Signs and goes on to talk about the number of signs. And, and when you go to the next page, there's item five that seems to be saying that in addition to what we just read back on uh, that item one, H1, you get another sign. And I would just point that out. If, if everything in H1 gets one more sign as set forth in that additional regulations, maybe you just need to add that one sign back Re into the number. Refer. Um, or refer. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I had, and this gets into the political uh, issue. Um, special events. A special, the term special event is not defined, well let me come at it from a different direction. Is the, the special event language on the next section, um, I guess it's P, intended to include anything other than an election? No, the revision is intended to pull elections into the special event category. Okay, but is anything else in the category? Because I, I didn't find a definition of the term special event. I realize there's the sentence that said, you know, in an election context, every one of these things equals a special event. But I was unclear whether anything else is in the category of special event because it is an undefined term. It, it is, and it would be an event such as a the gun, county fair or a gun show, antique show, um, special opening, grand opening sale event, uh, things like that. Okay. But it, it would. You, it's defined, you know, it's, it's based on an event that's occurring on a property, and not, not intended to be a, I guess, an undefined year-round uh, event. Lots of times it's tied into a temporary use permit, which is a whole separate category of permitting and review where the signs go hand-in-hand -hand with that permit. But as far as whether or not it's specifically defined, I don't believe it is. Or even again, again, the explanation you just gave to me is clear. I understand it once the explanation is given. But just looking at the language here where there wasn't any other language expanding special event beyond right. the election scenario. That, that's a good comment. And as you mentioned, if nothing else, we could list some examples such as. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes, if nothing else, that's helpful. Yeah. So we'll certainly um, take that advice too. And out of curiosity, um, during the election season, as you defined it here, the, is there anything requiring, well, first of all, a special event is any candidate, any issue, et cetera, as a topic on the ballot. 
And you can imagine on a presidential year, there's going to be a whole bunch of those things, you know, 30 or 40. Is there anything requiring that the signs be directed at the election issues? <laughs> uh, that's, that's kind of what I thought. That's, yeah, that's, that that's was where you track. felt like you couldn't cross over to content-based regulation. That's correct. So that is, so that is the loophole, so to speak. So that essentially is. during election season, you have more, anybody has more opportunity to put mm -hmm. any sign they want during election season. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we may see some abuses then. We can't do too much about it. We can, we can have plenty of election sales. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have any questions or comments? One of the yes. questions. Mr. Landers. Uh, question I have regarding your additional numbers for the open house and the question on the enforcement. I mean, open houses are generally on the weekends or is there enforcement on the weekends? The staff out on the weekends? Yes. And how do you determine how many times they've had it up in a year? I'm just looking at the enforceability of this. It's not going to be an exact enforcement. We're not going to go around every weekend and keep a ledger, but I think if we see a sign on a regular route and it starts to become apparent to us that I've seen that sign there I'm pretty sure for the last four weeks, then we're going to start looking at it and if it's still there, we'll start taking notes. But um, let me just, you know, in, in a reference point here is again, for like garage sale signs, we have another section of our code that actually specific, specifically limits garage sales at residences to three times per calendar year. So there's a cross-reference that we have for uh, to look at. And again, a lot of it's complaint-based, and that's what we'll respond to and start focusing. Um, but this would be the limit. Um, again, we're trying to put all signs con content neutral in the same category, and that's where we're trying to balance What's the duration we want folks to have garage sale signs up year round in the same category of house, uh, open house signs? So, again, while it's not perfectly enforceable, uh, we, we think in general it's, it is something we, we do look at and we do have weekend enforcement. I think it would, like Jerome was indicating, I think it had to be a, a, an egregious type of example for us to, we're not going to be keeping track of how many times it's out there, all the different signs. Uh, for open house signs, I, th I don't think we actually have many problems with it. Uh, people complying now, they, you know, they don't leave them up. You know, when the house is there, there's no open house, there's there's not much of an incentive to do that. They can't go to a closed house, but um, the but I, I think I think it again, it had to be something that was left up or that was obviously had been there all year or something like that. That'd be my guess. The more common enforcement relates to where it's located, where it's not supposed to be or oversized versus duration. I'm just thinking of the practicality of it. I mean, you, do, you don't have it as much as you used to, but it's probably coming with current market conditions that you're going to have a builder who has a spec house that he's selling off of on a continual basis, which will run afoul of the situation. And I'm not looking to infringe upon somebody's rights, but also looking at a business person who's out there as well. You would not have the same opportunity that somebody's in a subdivision that's accommodated. You know, they could put an open house sign at the subdivision continually. Right. Again, as I think it's part of that that balancing uh, because we have to treat other s similar signs without content based. So we, we think this is accommodating. And again, I think it'd have to be an egregious example to, to run afoul of the number. And, and you're correct. It's, it, that's not an easy number to enforce. Not, none of them are. But we think this gives a pretty broad allowance. Which reminds me that uh, over in 956.15.1 on page 11 of that attachment, you have regulations for active <coughs> subdivisions and I don't remember that I saw the word active defined I assume that means the developer is still I don't know building or still selling or building something, yeah, that's, but that's correct in other words, <clears throat> there's still development to occur in that 
subdivision. It's not built out. Okay. Well, again, you may consider clarifying what that word active means because, again, someone would have trouble pursuing under that section as to whether a place is active or not. Certainly the, the clear example is not a problem where the developer is still building, still selling, but over at the fringes of the, of the uh, possibilities it becomes a little bit gray. Okay, any other questions or comments from the commissioners to staff? If not, we'll go ahead and reopen the continued public hearing. Would any member of the public like to be heard on this matter? Nobody coming forward, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Commissioners, what is your favor? Well, we've, we've sat on this for almost two months. I think the improvement that has come through this is great. I think it's time to send it to the county commission. So I move that we approve this uh, redraft um, to go to county commission. Okay, we have a motion by Dr. Day. Do we have a second to that motion? A second. Mr. Stewart seconds it. Uh, any discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion, please signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries unanimously. That brings us to agenda item uh, 7B, which is another public hearing. And I'll go ahead and read it into the record. It is the county initiated request <coughs> to amend or update the mixed use policy 5.6 of the future land use element of the county's comprehensive plan. That's a legislative matter. Mr. Bowling. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll turn it over to uh, Bill Shute. <clears throat> Good evening, commissioners. Good evening. Uh, being the last item, I'll try to make it go fairly quickly, but uh, there, there's a fair amount of information to review about the existing mixed use policy, <clears throat> proposed amendment, and about the amendment process. Starting with the comprehensive plan amendment process, uh, that process is set up by state statute, involves multiple steps over time that can last multiple months. This includes a public hearing that we have here tonight. Um, as shown on the slide, a transmittal public hearing before the Board of County Commissioners. Um, as shown, there's a tentative date of sometime in March of 2017 for that. Um, uh, that then you have the transmission of that application to state and regional review agencies. Um, then you receive the comments back from and, and any proposed modifications from those state and regional review agencies. You have another public hearing, the third and final public hearing before the Board of County Commissioners. That's projected to be in sometime in June of 2017. And then you have the, at that time, the potential adoption and, and transmittal to the state land planning agency. With respect to the proposed amendment, the purpose of the amendment, well, it's to amend future land use element policy 5.6 criteria for mixed use plan developments to pro provide for an increased PD project size and modified development criteria for preferred location areas. And what are preferred location areas? A preferred location area is an area that is adjacent to both a commercial industrial node and a major public or educational facility such as Indian River State College and meets other mixed use location criteria. Those include being along a major roadway and having a land use designation of L1, L2, M1, M2, or M2, excuse me, residential land use designation. And the air photo that is up on the screen now just gives you an idea of the existing area that is nearby Indian River State College. You have a lot of vacant <coughs> land. I guess that's the point shown here. Um, some of it wooded and some of it more open. <clears throat> With this mixed use policy, there is, there is some history to go over. Um, it starts back in 2008 at the time of the county's development of the evaluation and appraisal report. So with, um, with uh, comprehensive plans in the state of Florida, 
we, there's a process of evaluating them every so often. And, um, and we did this back in 2008 just to assess where, where we were and what modifications needed to be done. So at that time, the, the policy was de to developed to allow and encourage development of mixed-use PDs at certain locations and residentially designated areas. So it was a concept at that point in 2008. In 2010, when we looked at actually amending the comprehensive plan, um, it was, there was an adopted policy, policy 5.6. And <clears throat> later on, as, as we started to look at implementing this and people approached us, in 2013 there was a request to allow fuel sales and alter the timing of commercial development construction, and that policy was amended to allow for those. Then also in 2013, um, an another thing happened that they were looking at the economic development impacts countywide at various things, and the Board of County Commissioners authorized staff to pursue a number of economic development initiatives, including analysis of commercial zoning and mixed use allowances along, specifically along State Road 60 near 66th Avenue. And, it, and since then, staff has coordinated with Indian River State College staff and a private landowner regarding land use, shared infrastructure, and future development near State Road 60 and 66 Avenue. Um, an important thing to note here, too, is Indian River State College is not subject to county development review process. There's exemption state statute for that. Um, now, county rules would be focused on adjacent private property and shared access and infrastructure. In the process of evaluating that, um, we look, looked and, and, and in lieu of expanding the commercial industrial node, a special mixed use PD concept was developed that focuses on shared infrastructure, increased overall PD size, increased allowable commercial area, and a special mix of uses on vacant land at State Road, six, State Road 60, 66 <coughs> Avenue intersection adjacent to the vacant Indian River State College campus acres, which we had shown previously. And in October 2016, uh, Commissioner Zorik reported to the Board of County Commissioners the, the coordinated activities and special mixed use concept. And in November of 15th, or on November 15th, 2016, BCC formally considered and directed staff to move forward with a comprehensive plan amendment for the special mixed use preferred location plan developments. So proposed policy 5.6, um, the changes are intended to accommodate large, larger project master plan area uh, projects to, to require and incentivize providing major shared infrastructure that's going to integrate commercial and residential development with a reconfigured Indy River State College campus. Um, this slide and next slide has, has a little bit of detail of showing where the the main changes have a, are proposed. Um, the blue center column is the current mixed use policy, so the blue text. And the, the right column that's in, in red text are the proposed modifications. So if you look at the, the first row with, with substance, you have 40 acres for maximum project area. And that's under the current mixed use policy. The proposed preferred location mixed use policy modification is for 80 acres. Uh, maximum commercial use would be changed from 25%, not to exceed 10 acres, to 50%, not to exceed 30 acres. Um, vertical mixing of uses, residential and or office above commercial uses. Maximum commercial of 30%, not to exceed 12 acres would be changed just for the preferred location areas to maximum commercial of 60%, not to exceed 30 acres. Allowed commercial uses would stay mostly the same. You have lodging, institutions, office, retail, personal service, restaurant and fuel sales uses. Um, but with this, you, we also introduced the concept of live work commercial flex space. Um, again, playing into the fact that the college is there as well. What is that? Live work flex, but a live work. It's cut off on what we're looking at here, but yeah. I wondered what that <coughs> was. Yeah, it's a nice vague planning term that attorneys <laughs> don't like. Um, 
which I can understand. It's, it's meant to be literally a space that could, over the life of the space, it's designed and laid out so that it, it could be either a portion of it or all of it could go back and forth between residential and commercial. Sometimes it's split use, uh, but sometimes it could be, uh, you know, it could be a, an apartment with a, with a production studio or something built into it. But also over time, there are some points in time in, in the life of a project it could be commercial and sometimes it could be converted back to residential so it could actually toggle back and forth. Am I correct in understanding that that change applied to all of these mixed use PDs and not just the preferred location? That's correct. Yeah. So it, it actually it's going to it will yeah it will be in both uh, not just the preferred location PDs but that's any correct. Mixed use like space. That's okay. correct. Okay. Uh, continuing on, the maximum individual commercial building size, uh, the current mixed use policy is 25,000 square feet, and the proposed preferred location mixed use policy modification is 60,000 square feet. Um, with this mixed use PD, access drives, access roads, and bridges are proposed. Um, and they'd be required in, in the mixed use policy if adjacent to Indiana River State College is, and this, this includes the 66 Avenue Access Road, State Road 60 Access Road, Lateral A Canal Bridge, and 66 Avenue 18th Street Traffic Signal. Uh, timing of construction, um, the current mixed use policy has no more than three acres or 50% of total commercial may be constructed until at least 25% of residential constructed is constructed and CO'd. Uh, with the changes for this preferred location mixed use policy, um, no more than 15 acres or 50% of total commercial may be constructed until infrastructure needed uh, to serve entire PD, PD has either been constructed or designed and committed to via an enforceable developer's agreement. The image before you is, is showing the future land use designations and also it's showing some of the property ownership. Uh, so you can see the area for Indian River State College properties. It's sh shaded more of a brownish color that's for M1 multi uh, residential designation. And Indian River State College is more of the, the lighter colored in that with the pattern. And then there's an X pattern that's darker that shows the property ownership is all currently controlled under one owner. Under the analysis, the, the mixed use PD approach is um, produces a preferred development form. There's PD design control guarantees that when you're de developing under a planned development that otherwise would not be available under conventional zoning. Uh, the property adjacent to Indiana State College is a unique mixed use opportunity. You, you have the, the campus there that's one location in the county specific and the students there in the, in the mix and then you have the commercial and residential opportunity for mix, mixture and like Stan said the live work flex opportunities. Um, integrating in Indiana River State College future campus expansion and adjacent development infrastructure, there's a unique opportunity for master planning the area. <clears throat> With um, the development of, of this proposed mixed use revisions and the meetings that have been had with the adjacent property owner to Indiana River State College, Indiana River State College as well, um, a concept sketch was developed and with an access point, you can see access in State Road 60 and reconfiguration of ownership of, of lots um, with Indian River State College, potentially um, having ownership to the east of that proposed access point and the private land developer owning the property to the west. Um, with this concept, Institu institutional uses would buffer residentially designated neighborhoods to the east. And the concept would be implemented through execution of documents to realign ownership and coordinated infrastructure and through developer obtaining mixed use PD approval. So for right now it's the concept, but the connections and those other infrastructure items are 
solidified in the mixed use policy. Uh, the image above now shows you the potential mixed use project area and the, the, the overall size that it could potentially be. And again, it shows the land ownership as the earlier slide does. Bill, and it goes across 66 six Avenue on both sides, east and west. Bill, I, I, have, I have a question. You see there where the reserve at Vero Beach is, is depicted. If they would have come in, say this is approved, Mm -hmm. and they would have come in a year from now after this is approved. Would their development be any different? Could it be any different? Your question, Bill, is that if, could that be a, a site that's adjacent to, it's adjacent to a node, it's adjacent to the Indian River State College campus? Yes, that would have been. So then they could have gone to 50% commercial instead of the lower amount. They would have had the ability to apply for a project to do okay. that. They wouldn't be guaranteed anything. All right. Thank you. That, that helps me greatly. Thank you. And I would just go on to say, since they have developed residential immediately to their west, I don't think that they could have taken the full opportunity. This, this setting of, of this particular policy you know, doesn't have neighbors adjacent to where I think the commercial We'll see. But again, we don't have a project plan in front of us. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, back on November 15th, when the Board of County Commissioners was introduced to the mixed use PD proposed revisions, um, <clears throat> there was a concern, concern raised that commercial component could be developed uh, with no obligation to complete the residential units. Uh, and as shown in the bullet points, Prior to completion of commercial, the policy 5.6 revisions do not require completion of residential units, but they do require a developer to construct or bond out infrastructure required for the residential area and to obtain conceptual or final plan approval for all residential development. Um, another point to, to note here as, as well is, you know, the, the county has, has limited experience for State Road 60 mixed uses, but w with with the experience, we have seen that the commercial lags residential typically, and smaller. And the one example that uh, Attorney Bill, Bill DeBrallo pointed out as well, Vero Lago, Vero Reserve. Excuse me, <laughs> thinking another place now. Um, but essentially, the residential had had come in and, and got developed, and you know some of the commercial is kind of a a mix occurring at the same time, but some of the commercials lagging in the front. <clears throat> With the comprehensive plan amendment, uh, policy 14.3 requires that one of four criteria be met to approve a comp plan amendment. And in this case, two of the criteria are met, an oversight in an approved plan, and a substantial change in circumstances. Uh, with respect to the oversight, the existing limits on the on the development size of 40 acres and development timing with respect to State Road 60 and 66 Avenue and even River State College area was too restrictive. It did not provide adequate size project for a master planning of the Indian River State campus and adjacent property into a preferred mixed mixed use form. And with respect to substantial change of circumstances, those recent agreements and concept that were shown showed to you between Indian River State College and adjacent landowner was previously unanticipated. Unanticipated that they were going to propose realignment and, and changing property ownership, and it, it provides a new opportunity for the coordinated planning. Now, now with the proposed changes of the mixed use policy 5.6. There's other steps that, that need to occur beyond just the mixed-use policy changes. And that involves the land development regulations. And staff will initiate a land development regulation amendment to section 915.20, which is the plan development regulations of the county's LDRs if the Board of County Commissioners agrees to transmit the subject amendment to the state. The companion land development regulation changes will be presented to the Planning and Zoning Commission, so you will get to see those 
uh, for consideration and recommendations to the Board of County Commissioners. With that, the planning the recommendation is that the Planning and Zoning Commission recommend that the Board of County Commissioners approve the request to amend policy 5.6 of the future land use element of the comprehensive plan. <clears throat> Any questions or comments by the commissioners? Okay, I have a few. <laughs> I'll keep hoping someone will step in before me, but uh, the um, The PD's not following under this new category we're talking about creating. Um, and it's on uh, section three of the draft up, I'm sorry, page three of the proposed draft changes, timing of construction, new paragraph 19. Uh, in other words, the other PD's, no more than three acres or 50% of total commercial area allowed uh, shall be constructed until at least 50, 25 percent of the proposed residential development has been constructed. I need you to explain to me what was the underlying policy that was sought to be achieved there because it seems to me we're mitigating that policy with this new category we're creating. So I'm trying to understand what we're, what we're losing by doing so. Right. <clears throat> and I think that the 19 applies to, and a good example is the Reserve Bureau. <clears throat> there you have a, a property that is a good location for mixed use. It had commercial industrial on one side of it, and you had the shopping center on one side, and it had residential on the other. So it was literally in between existing residential and, uh, and commercial. And so the, the way that the, the ordinance is set up and the mixed use policy is that Three quarters of that property has to be residential use. It's predominantly going to be residential use and three quarters of it. 25% of it, uh, up to 25% can be commercial. And in the PD context, you can make that compatible with the residential that it's next to. And it's kind of become sort of a, tr a transition there. And the idea is that because three quarters of the project has to be residential, you want to make sure that residential development, you know, someone doesn't develop the commercial and then you don't get the residential development behind it. It is supposed to be most of the area is supposed to be developed for residential. Now we go to this preferred location. And in the, the context, you've got a non-residential, even though it's in a residentially designated area, you have an institutional campus for a college that's on one side of, of a property um, that's, a, that's essentially a non-residential use allowed in a residential area. Um, and you would have an allowance for more commercial, a higher percentage of commercial in that context next to the institutional, and then you would be creating new residential up against you know, existing or other plain residential further away. So you actually already have kind of a buffering institutional use that's, that's part of the equation here. And, and what, one of the things that we're, so I think from a land use standpoint, you have, uh, a more intense project in that type of location because you can put more intensity next to an institutional use like a major college, for this area, a major college campus. And the other, the other idea that's, that's going on in this proposal at the same time is to incentivize uh, contribution and actually a requirement of, of shared access between the campus and the mixed use project. Um, and so this gives more flexibility to a developer. If we have a developer that you know, takes advantage of this and, and does this concept, they'll have an extra requirement of infrastructure and they'll have more flexibility on uh, putting more commercial in up front. Uh, but ultimately they're gonna, have less they're gonna have less residential area that they're required to build as well. I that said a lot, I don't know if that. Well, I'm interpreting what you said <clears throat> to base to basically be that this preferred location PD is only going to apply to one site. And when we look at that one site, we don't have the same residential buffer concerns that we did, for example, on the reserve. That, that, that's correct. This location is the only location currently that meets this preferred location. Mm -hmm. And the reason we, we went with 
a more generic, a preferred location. It's conceivable that you could have at some other point in, in the county uh, another educational facility or something. If you had something similar to any River State College, this sort of end that had the major roadways and so forth, you know, you would have the opportunity there. But you're exactly right, and we said in our staff report, this is the only location that we could apply this to. And we do have policies uh, in our comp plan that are very kind of geographically specific, such as where we have um, a specific policy for the industrial park out west of, of I-95 in that particular area. To do an industrial park in that area, you have to come in as a plan development. Uh, and, and, we, so we, and this is one of those occasions where there is a very specific area of the county that this is targeted toward. The, as I understand it, as written, the only requirements with respect to when the, when the residential portions will be built are at a minimum a conceptual plan be approved and number two um, the infrastructure that will serve the residential portion has been designed I realize as constructed or designed but design is obviously the less lesser of those two terms so the infrastructure for the residential portion has been designed and committed to via an enforceable developers agreement Okay, so um, this is the way we intended that construction, and, and I think we have, it has it has been constructed or designed and committed to via an enforceable developers right. agreement. So you, you're, it's either been constructed or it's been designed and essentially bonded out. So, for, so there there would be a time period on that that bonding out. There would be an agreement that specified when that infrastructure would have to be completed. I mean, in a real pinch, is there anything requiring them that, to ever build out the residential portion? No, not a requirement. But what, what they'll have is a huge investment in infrastructure ready to build multifamily areas I mean, within could, the project. They could bond it out, for example, that resident, uh, the infrastructure serving the residential portion, then the market tanks. Correct. And they could lose their bond. Um, right, then the infrastructure. Saw back in the mid-2000s. Yeah, like, like in a... Like a uh, like a subdivision is allowed to bond out uh, imp infrastructure improvements to do, they could do that, you're correct. And, and unless and until something were to change and somebody came along to build, build the residential, there wouldn't be any requirement. They would not be violating anything by that, not building the residential. That, that's correct. Yeah. That's so correct. even though it's an enforceable developer's agreement, you can't enforce it to require them to build the residential. The enforceable developer's agreement would be I mean, I, I think, the, I think the, the backstop for any requirement like the county has where somebody posts a bond is if they don't perform, the county the pulls the bond and, and goes out to bid and has somebody perform that construction. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, but the, cons the bond, the bond's only for the infrastructure. The correct. Not for, not for vertical units. That's correct. We would not, we don't have a requirement that they build vertical residential units. And, that, and, you're, and that's exactly the concern that was raised in November. Is that, worth the ri is that a risk? Mm -hmm. It is a risk. How much of a risk is it that someone is going to do all the shared infrastructure, uh, get their plan approval for all the residential development, whether it's, commer whether it's conceptual or all the way down to the final stage, put in all the infrastructure for it, and then let it sit? And then for how long is it going to sit? It, in, in staff's estimation, it's going to have a lot of value for that. and like. Like Bill said, actually our experience has been um, limited here in Indian River County, but our experience has been that uh, we, we don't have situations in mixed use with Point West or with the Reserve Bureau where somebody's done that, where that's, that's happened. But it is a potential. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the, the only other thing I'd mention is just a, well, have any of the adjoining property owners to this? I, I doubt they've been notified at this stage, have they? I can't speak, I believe actually some have been talking. The, the, on the east side of, of 66th Avenue, uh, you have the State College and you have uh, 
and adjacent owner that owns all, everything else, 266 Avenue and 60. So that, that covers that side. On the west side, the, um, the property owner has obviously been involved in the discussions, and I believe they've also discussed um, the concept, or someone has discussed the concept with properties, residentially designated properties to the west. And this master area, uh, the 80 acres, uh, could go several acres beyond what the individual property owner owns. So we may have more than one property owner involved in kind of master planning the whole area, up to 80 acres. Uh, but I believe, and, and you know, the applicant can speak to it. I think they're aware of the concept. Um, but again, what, um, just, to, just to be clear, and I'm sure it's clear to you, Mr. Chairman, but this is a policy, let's say this gets adopted, it doesn't mean anybody's ever gonna use a policy. Mm -hmm. it, it's an allowance, it's an opportunity, and it would take uh, a project developer coming forward and, and maybe assembling even more property or getting other property owners involved and in, in doing an entire 80 acres, or it might be 60. It, again, it would be, it, you know, we, we would see if a project application ever came When in. an application comes in for a plan development, um, what is the Board of County Commissioner's discretion in that? And, and specifically, if we have a zoning code that says I can have a chicken yeah. farm in this zoning category and I, ha and I have property there and I meet the land use and I, the zoning allows a chicken farm, mm -hmm. my understanding right. is I can build a chicken farm. Right. Now over here, my understanding is generally the county has a lot more discretion in approving PD. Correct. Correct. That's correct, because they have other uses. In other words, they have by right uses on this property. The property adjacent to the Indian River State College is designated residential. They could come in and do conventional residential, no commercial, and they have the right to do that. So that's kind of their backstop. Um, what this is doing is giving them more uses in return for a, a, a preferred form and a lot of infrastructure improvements and working with the State College to do something that, that that makes sense in terms of reconfiguring the campus and reconfiguring the, the private property. So it's an incentive, lots of discretion. I think, the board, you know, you're asking a planner mm -hmm. what discretion the board has. I, I think they have a lot of discretion and, and that's one of the kind of the, that's one of the safeguards of this amendment is that it's, everything's gonna be in the context of a plan development at public hearings, notice to surrounding property owners um, and, and discretion, a lot of discretion that the board has. What would be the harm in saying no more than 80% of the commercial development can take place prior to or until the residential infrastructure is in? So at least you hold out that final 20% yeah, as and the club, if you will, to make sure that the residential piece gets in there. Right. Two, two answers to that. And that's the Planning and Zoning Commission could recommend that. The board, you could get input from, um, uh, from the interested property owner. Um, right, there's, there's no, you, you could come up with another number. You could come up with a threshold. Uh, actually, during the PD process itself, the board could come up with a number. I mean, these are the, these are the outside parameters of it. Mm -hmm. If that was a real concern, you know, the board could come up with something. However, um, again, staff is, is comfortable based on our experience and the amount of required infrastructure in this type of PD uh, that's not required in other types of PDs. That type of investment, we feel like they're going to have. To, there's a real incentive, but not a requirement. There's a real incentive, but not, but a, not a requirement to to ha get the residential built. Okay. One last comment, then I'll keep quiet. Um, I just I think there's a, a language error in sections 20 and 21. If you go up to 19, right above it, uh, in the other PDs, no more than three acres or 50 percent, so on and so forth. When you come down to 20 and 21, that no more than language doesn't read, it's not there. What's there is up to 10 right. acres, right. shall be constructed until, I think that the intent was no more than, than 10 acres. Yeah, uh, to exceed that, 50% that, that make, shall yeah, be constructed. I think that's a good point. Yeah, I think there's mm -hmm. just the language. I, I see the intent of the language, but the rest of the sentence doesn't I, read. I think oh. that would improve it. Yeah, just so take a look at that. And I'm sorry to take so long. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Yes, Mr. Landers. A couple items that you brought up, but one of those was the um, the bridge over the canal to 60 uh, to 66th Avenue would be 
taken care of at a minimum with the bond, not necessarily having to be built regardless, correct? That's correct. It. It's part of the infrastructure. Constructed or designed and committed to via a, an enforceable developer's agreement. That's correct. And, and then you brought up an issue as to the only location, but just out of curiosity, wouldn't uh, the 20th Avenue and Oslo location uh, where the potential high school would be be somewhat similar situation with the residential around it? I wouldn't see, I'd not see a high school as, as, as qualifying. I mean, I mean you're, you're right. That, you could make an argument. Someone could make an argument that that's a major public faci uh, educational facility. You know, the staff wouldn't see it that way. We've, we've, we've got, you know, two of, two of them already in the county. Um, what you have with a, with a college campus, I think you've, you've got more public participation in that. You've got conferences and so forth that happen there. Um, you've probably got a little more after hours activity and so forth with that. Um, but so we, we wouldn't consider that a, a preferred location. But if you, I mean, you could conceivably have a type of school that came in that was more than a traditional high school. Possibly that could be considered a major, a major public institution. Having, having dealt with some of those developers who think outside of the box, and I appreciate how they would that. Incorporate that, and that that high school lo location could potentially end up being a vocational high school. Mm -hmm. I could see how a developer would think that that might fit inside their box, but. Um, you know, regarding the residential, I, realistically, the commercial that's there, the residential with the infrastructure makes it that much more valuable to a potential builder down the road anyways, um, and more viable. And I know we're dealing with that now with some of the builders that are looking at not the paper subdivisions, but the defunct subdivisions that can jump into. So and there's a lot of benefits to everybody in this respect. Any other questions or comments of staff? If not, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Uh, anybody who'd like to speak, please come to the podium, give us your name and address, and have your say. Good evening. I'm Christopher Marine with the law firm of Gould Cooksey Fennell. I represent uh, Vero 12 LLC and the uh, Greenfield Trust. We're the private party or the adjacent owner that everybody keeps referring to. Um, they have the property that's, that's under consideration here. Right now, and in fact, I have my project engineer here with me this evening and real estate agent and also a representative from State College. We appreciate the opportunity to participate in this process. We actually appeared back um, in November before the County Commission and discussed this. Just to tell you where, where we're at, we're presently working on developing the legal agreements that are necessary to reconfigure the site kind of geometry and, uh, and to kind of implement the exchanges that are necessary to get the configuration that's in your materials. It doesn't look like that now, but it will look like that when we get through it. We're pretty far along in the process. I've drafted documents and working with the State College's attorneys. We have a meeting that's scheduled to uh, first part of February, where I think we'll hammer out the remaining details and then I think we'll be on a, a really good, uh, clear path towards, towards making the properties look just like they look in your materials. Um, so that's good stuff and, and it's moving forward, we believe, very well. Back in, uh, in November, we looked at the policy that was drafted at, at that particular time, and we liked most of it, but we did have a couple of comments. Staff took those comments and drafted what you have before you right now. And we think they did a very good job. We actually had one little point of clarity, and it was the same one that, um, that Alan made and I sent that over to um, Sasan Shakespeare, I mean Sasan Rahani a couple days ago and he, I think he liked it. I, I think he, Stan, yes. Sasan, did you like that one? Okay. <laughs> but with that, we think it's very well drafted and we think it has all of the appropriate clarity necessary when you have um, essentially two different classes of preferred location areas. But um, we're very comfortable with the text 
the way that it's drafted right now. And again, we appreciate the opportunity to participate in this uh, process with you. David, do you have anything to add? Or, um, we're in good shape. Any, any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Chris, the same question I asked uh, Stan. From, from your client's standpoint, would it hinder this project if there was some backstop requirement that uh, with respect to the completion of commercial development, um, in other words, no more than let's say 80% of commercial development can be constructed uh, without at least the residential infrastructure being constructed? Well, the concern that we had back in uh, November was just that in our opinion, commercial and residential aren't going to happen at the same time. Staff says, you know, they kind of think that r residential precedes commercial. I think you'd probably find, maybe not so much in Indian River County, but certainly elsewhere, that the reverse of that can be true as well. So our, our point is, it's probably not going to happen at the same time. Certainly could, but given the fact that it's not going to, we prefer not to kind of limit or restrict either one. Um, we think that there's sufficient safeguards in the policies as they're drafted presently um, to have the, uh, the protection, I think, that the county requires here. Does that answer the question? Well, the safeguard that you're talking about is, is either building the infrastructure or, well, actually, in this case, actually bonding out the infrastructure so that right. if you don't build it, a bond's going to be Right, there's a threshold. The to get over that threshold, mm -hmm you've got to um, build out the, the roadway improvements, signalization, intersection, bridge, um, or bond them. Either way, there's, there's that protection there. Um, we've got to present and have approved a, a conceptual residential, and we've got to do some measure of infrastructure related to that. Um, that's a pretty long way, and my concern always has been, I expressed it at the, at the earlier meeting, you get to the point where if you push too much up in terms of expectations on commercial, then it, you risk running good, legitimate, um, reputable, desirable commercial development away to some other community. I, that's a, a nice way of putting it, but um, we think that there's sufficient safeguards there and we support it as, as it's drafted. How does all this work when you've got two different owners of this PD project? I guess you do. Well, one of which is public and the other is private. You, would, you wouldn't necessarily. The, the key here, and, and Chris has probably worked all this out, but you know, the, the infrastructure has to be in place. It, it could be on state college property. It could be on the developer's property. It could be on both. There could be reciprocal easements. Uh, that sort of thing. So the, the actual placement of the infrastructure, the, you know, in terms of this, this policy doesn't tell them whose property it has to go on. I'm kind of struggling with it. But I mean, maybe you've got a real world answer here. But, but th that would be the sort of thing that would be worked out. And you know, if it's on state college property, they'd obviously have to, um, uh, have to sign off on the application and authorize that portion of the project. Uh, but again, you know, traditionally, you know, we've got a we've got a, a good relationship with the state college. They're, they're not subject to our LDR requirements. The re the requirement here would be infrastructure, whose property it's on. You know, as long as it's public access. Uh, but, but maybe Chris has some logistics worked out on. Yeah, Alan, as part and parcel of the, um, I call it the exchange agreement, that involves the reconfiguration of the present boundaries. It involves um, the various exchanges that are necessary. And then there's actual legal undertakings that survive the closing where uh, commitments are made to develop these roadway improvements. Now, right now, the plan is to have this roadway that kind of snakes through the middle of the property. That'll be an ease, it'll be state college property, but, but with a retained easement. The roadway and the various improvements, the bridge, the intersection, et cetera, will all be built by um, what we call the developing party. And those legal requirements and those legal duties and, and uh, obligations are all created in this exchange agreement. If the property change hands, changes hands, 
the party who accepts title is going to have to undertake those duties as part of the, of the closing. So yeah, there are some moving parts, but I think we've got our arms around them. Part of this is to allow Indian River State College to expand? Right, they certainly have plans for expansion, but what I think this does is achieve some objectives that that everybody has, actually. And one of them is to get access and an entrance yeah. on State Road 60 and kind of ultimately face west a lot of it uh, and have access to 66th Avenue. And when you think about it, you know, that, yeah. that access opens up, you know, the 66th Avenue being major north-south road, that access opens up students from Sebastian, Felsmere, what have you, you know, coming down 66th Avenue and not having to get on to 58th Avenue, go through 5860 intersection, go through College Lane. So it really opens up access to, to the campus, and I think that's been an objective of, of the State College for, for some time. Is expansion by the college into this area considered commercial under this, these terms that we're talking it's, about? It's, it's non-residential, okay. and it's on residential property. It's an institutional use that's allowed in this designation. And like I said, we said before, they're, they have special treatment by the state uh, and so they could have some uses that are commercial. Uh, some people consider, I mean, you have certainly places of assembly. You've got conference areas. They could open up a culinary school. They could serve if they wanted to. I mean, there's, there's some things that they, that they could do. Uh, but again, overall, we're considering them institutional use, but a lot of public activity there. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Marine? Anything else by Mr. Marine? No, that's it. Thank you. Anybody else like to be heard on this matter? If not, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Members of the commission, it's your pleasure. Well, I have no problem seeing this move forward <clears throat> um, and would make a motion that we approve with staff's recommendations and, and would you like that upper limit added to that or well I, I think the problem that I'm having um, I guess I I I don't understand well enough or clearly enough to vote against what's in front of us and insist upon some type of backstop um, you know, it's in the other PDs, you know, with a clear, a clear line. We don't have a clear line here, but this is a unique situation. And we are dealing with a Indian River State College, which is a state entity, which as you say, is not subject to our rules to start with. Um, so I, I guess I have concerns. I saw that one of the commissioners for whom I have great respect had concerns about this issue but again I just don't feel like I know sure. clearly enough to say it needs to be there but, and therefore I would vote against this proposal unless it has it. If you don't mind Mr. Chairman if I can maybe just add just a little bit of experience that we got with the Reserve Bureau which um, which which influences some of the ways that, that staff is, is looking at this. Like I said in, in the, what would be the other types of mixed-use projects like the Reserve Bureau is predominantly a residential project. Three quarters of it is residential. And what you really need there is a residential developer driving the project. Um, and one of the reasons from our observation that that project has worked is because it's, it's not difficult to market and sell the out parcels, you know, in that situation. That gets you, you know, cash up front. But the residential developer is in it from the very beginning. And, and so, that residential developer, I think, helps convince the commercial developers that are going to be doing their part of the project that the residential is going to move forward and none of the thresholds are going to hang up the commercial developer. In this case, I think what you have is, what you're going to have is a commercial developer driving the project. And, you know, if he's, if he's going to try to market his commercial product and he's not the one building the residential, He's got to convince the commercial guys, hey, listen, you've got 20 acres to work with here. We'll make sure that these other guys perform their duty, but they're not the ones doing it. I think it's as much um, 
up one party of, who's wanting to, to know they have 20 acres of commercial they can develop, um, not wanting to be hung up with relying on what on a residential developer performing, who's, who's not driving the project. I mean, that's just my, my observation of one of the, the concerns. It's not necessarily the, the county and the, the commercial developer um, assessing the risk. <laughs> It's, it's the end user who's, who's looking at, oh, you know, well, where am I with this shopping center if, if the residential doesn't get built? So that, that's some of what, of what we see here, and I think what we see here is a commercial developer being in the lead, not a residential developer. Yeah, and, and I understand that, and I fully understand what Mr. Marine is saying. If I were in his client's shoes, I would be viewing it the same way. In other words, we're not exactly sure how this is going to unfold. We don't control all the factors that might go right. into that, right. but... Um, Therefore, we want to, we don't want to be constrained right. uh, by things that we might not be able to control. I, I fully understand that. So in answer to your question, <laughs> um, I, like I say, I just don't feel like I um, can really say, no, I would be opposed to it unless this is in it. I realize it's an issue that's going to have to be decided by the Board of County Commissioners eventually. So, okay, so in, in that case, I, I move, we, uh, move this forward uh, with staff's recommendations. Okay, we have a motion by Dr. Day. Do we have a second to that motion? By Ms. Waldrop. Uh, any further discussion concerning that motion? All in favor, please signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Um, that brings us to item eight, which is commissioner's matters. Does any commissioner have any matters? No. Nope. Um, that brings us to planning matters. Mr. Bowling. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple of items I want to welcome Ms. Waldrup um, to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Just wanted to let you all know that it's, we're, we're not, not likely to have a February 9th meeting, but we are likely to have a February 23rd meeting. Uh, just wanted to make sure that you all are aware of that. And uh, at the next Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, we, um, we will have a new Planning and Zoning Commissioner. We got notice this afternoon that Patrick Grawl is going to be the District 1 uh, appointee. So we'll be getting together with Mr. Grawl and going through the planning, offer the Planning and Zoning Commission orientation. And I expect you all to see Mr. Grawl at your next, uh, at your next meeting. That's all that I have, Mr. Chairman. And I would just add, and certainly it doesn't, uh, I won't be available on the 23rd, I think it is. I think I am available both meeting dates in, in March. March, thank you. But. Okay, anything, uh, oh, attorney's matters. I, I have no matters. Okay, and uh, that brings us, anything else come before us tonight? If not, th if not, thank you all for being here tonight, and we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. <laughs>